uh, and I look at the connection between contemporary Scandinavian horror and uh, what's found in saga literature, mythology, and folklore. Saga literature, written mostly in the 13th century in Iceland, but in other Scandinavian countries as well, contains just about every monster, revenant, and theme found in modern horror. This literature, which focuses on the settlement of Iceland, the exploits of gods and heroes, and the history of kings, is a literature of violence and revenge. And vengeance is often achieved after death. Even in the family sagas, those that deal with the everyday lives and histories of the Icelandic settlers, the supernatural and the mundane exist side by side with no hints of incredulity on the part of the characters or authors. This literature is also unusual in that its mixture of pagan and Christian mythoi is based on accounts within the relatively recent memory of the society. Iceland became Christian in the year 1000. Other like, unlike other conversions, this one was political rather than religious. Before Christianity was adopted, the main deity worshipped was Thor, as evidenced by the plethora of saga characters with names that contain some version of Thor, which always makes it really difficult to teach saga literature to students because they get all the Thor <laughs> names confused. However, other deities of the Norse pantheon were also worshipped. It was felt that political control would be easier if there was one official religion and God. But because the conversion was political rather than spiritual, and because many Icelanders treated Jesus as just one more God to add to an already crowded pantheon, the conversion was never really complete, and both religions continued to exist side by side. As a result, quite a bit is known about pre-Christian attitudes towards the dead and towards supernatural beings. Many of these beliefs continued in folklore and were mixed with Christian beliefs. Even today, the old beliefs are still present. In fact, this year in Iceland, there was a groundbreaking for a new heathen temple that was attended by 300 people, including the mayor of Reykjavik, who wielded a shovel in the ceremony. In a 1998 survey, quote, 54.4% of Icelanders said they believed in the existence of elves. That poll is fairly consistent with other findings and with qualitative fieldwork, according to uh, Vladimir Hafstein, who is a folklore professor at the University of Iceland. This belief in supernatural beings is carried into current fiction, both horror and detective fiction, whereas in the sagas, it is seen as just something that is part of Icelandic life. Uh, in this literature, as well as in the literature and films of other nations where Odin and his fellow deities once reigned supreme, the vestiges of the old beliefs and the depiction of the undead may be found, albeit modified by years of outside influences. Unar Jokel's daughter notes that, quote, at the beginning of my journey, I was somewhat confused by all the different kinds of hidden beings that people told me about, and realized I was looking for the pure Hulda folk of the sort that are described in folk tales and were talked out in my own district. But gradually, I got used to the idea that in Hulda folk beliefs, there are immigrants, new kinds of elves with clairvoyance, which clairvoyants talk about and describe, something that does not exist in the older stories and which demonstrates that this belief is alive. And new beings come into the world of stories as oral story tradition is always a mixture of influences from outside and ancient heritage." End quote. Throughout these contemporary films and works of fiction, we encounter various types of ghosts, walking dead, shapeshifters, odenic rites and spells, and even Odin himself. By far the most common su supernatural being found is the Draugr, or plural Draugr. In her seminal work, The Road to Hell, Hilda Ellis Davidson states that, quote, Draugr is the word used for the animated corpse that comes forth from its grave mound, or shows restlessness on the road to burial, end quote. Jakobsen expands this meaning to note that the word is most commonly translated as ghost. In both saga literature and in contemporary literature and film, Draugr can take several forms, from soulless zombies to people who were unpleasant before death and become even nastier afterward, to people who were wrongfully killed and seeking revenge, to the dead who just want to hang out. In Erebrynja Saga, there's an example of this last type in a group of drowned sailors who come back to their funeral feast and, quote, everyone welcomed them 
and thought this a happy omen because in those days it was believed that drowned people had been well received by the sea goddess Ram if they came to their own funeral feast, end quote. Unfortunately, they enjoyed it so much that they continued to come back, hogging the fire and bringing their dead friends with them. <laughs> the 2009 Nor Norwegian film Dead Snow, directed by Tommy Burkula, contains the best correspondence to the animate dead in saga literature. Like Shaun of the Dead, this film parodies the cliches of the zombie film genre, while at the same time is an important addition to that genre. In this film, a group of young people decide to spend a skiing holiday in a remote cabin. They plan to meet one of their group, who has inexplicably decided to ski her way through the mountains at the cabin. Of course, she never makes it. A mysterious stranger stops at the cabin, asks for some coffee, and proceeds to tell them about the evil presence in the mountains, a platoon of Nazi soldiers who never left. And there's treasure involved. When the young people find the treasure, thus attracting the zombie Nazi army, the usual carnage ensues. Like the undead in saga literature, these zombies are seeking out and wanting to protect a treasure that they believe is theirs, and their home is located in the mountain. Davidson explains that, quote, the belief in the dead entering the mountain is part of some kind of cult connected with high places, end quote. The young men, who would all serve in the military, put up a brave front and fight in the manner of Viking warriors, using a combination of modern weaponry and farm implements that could have come out of the Middle Ages. But it is to no avail. No matter what they do these zombie, to these zombies, they arise to fight again at the command of the zombie Nazi commander. This battle scene draws heavily on two saga sources. The closest source is Rolf's saga Kraka. In this saga, the peerless King Rolf and his band of warrior heroes including Bothbar Bjarki, the bear warrior, must fight an army of his sister Skuld and her husband Hjorvard. Skuld is a sorceress who works magic from a witch's scaffold set up in her black tent. She casts a spell on her own men so that they continue to come back from the dead, no matter how debilitating their wounds. Davidson notes that, quote, the full horror of the dead raised on the battlefield that is expressed by Rolf's warrior the idea of a spiritless corpse, maimed and wounded, showing nevertheless inextinguishable vigor. In quote, this horror is the same that is experienced by the young men in dead snow, and perhaps by those watching the film, when the zombie Nazis that everyone thought had been destroyed pop up from under the snow to fight again. A second source that is less closely aligned, but still important, is the story of two battling zombie armies. This story, told in several sources, tells of Hildur, who was kidnapped by the man she loved and taken away to the Orkney island of Hoy, where her father followed with his army to get her back. She and her lover both tried to get the father to make peace, but he refused. Hildur then turns both armies into zombie armies to battle it out eternally, or at least until Ragnarok. One thing that separates the saga literature zombie armies from that in the film is that both earlier examples are brought about through female sorcery. In the film, there is no explanation as to why the Nazis become zombies, except that the mysterious stranger emphasizes their total malevolence and greed. In saga literature, the greedy often transform after death into dragons or become Draugar who possessively guard their treasure. All three stories do connect to the myth of armies of dead soldiers fighting at Valhalla, Odin's home. One small detail connects dead snow with Odin. One of the female characters, Hannah, climbs a tree to escape the zombies and encounters a raven's nest. The threatened raven starts squawking and Hannah wrings its neck. Hannah does escape the zombies, but is accidentally killed by one of her friends. She is the only character whose death is not at the hands of a zombie, perhaps indicating that one may be able to escape a zombie, but one cannot escape Odin. And one certainly doesn't mess with Odin's ravens. Icelandic author Ursa Sigurdardottir is mainly known for her detective series, but has written one ghost novel that has been translated into English. Her detective fiction is also permeated with the supernatural, including various ghosts, Odinic rites, and even a reference to necropants. 
which is the dried skin of a man from the waist down. These horrifying leggings were used in a spell that would supposedly bring the caster more money. As noted in her novel Last Rituals, a replica necropants may be found at the Museum of Icelandic Sorcery and Witchcraft. And if you go to the website, uh, you can actually see a picture of them if you're interested. In her ghost novel, I Remember You, as well as in her most recent novel in her detective series, Someone to Watch Over Me, subtitled A Thriller, Ursa writes of the Draugar, or ghosts, that do not rest in peace, or actually do not rest at all, because they seek revenge. And in addition, in two cases, they have not been buried properly, another issue that often happens in saga literature. I Remember You is a complex and incredibly scary novel that blends wrongs from the distant past, the recent past, and the present. A husband and wife, their female friend, and her dog are dropped off by ship at a remote village, which is abandoned during the winter, but has some life as a resort during the summer. The setting is when there is no electrical power, no cell phone signal, and no one else in the village. Ursa turns the screw on this already creepy scenario by adding a vindictive and violent child ghost who kills victims long distance, takes their eyes, and carves crosses into their skin. An eerie old cemetery, an array of bad smells and strange sounds, and the reactions of the dog, who is the most sympathetic and intelligent character in the book. <laughs> she also uses one particularly effective trope from folklore mythology and saga literature, the seal who could really be a human, either alive or dead, in the shape-shifted form. A pair of seals takes great interest in the activities of the trio and their dog. Katrin, the most sympathetic human character in the book, is at first amused by them and sees them as something lively and positive in this otherwise dead place. However, as they continue to follow her, she stops finding them amusing. This change begins slowly. Quote, from time to time, she looked toward the seals and was never disappointed. They shifted their positions slightly, but continued to stare in her direction. Of course, they were too far away for her to get a good look at their faces, but she recalled the saying, seals have men's eyes. As the hauntings become more pronounced and violent, the seals seem to become to Katrine more than just seals. Quote, the creatures appeared to be watching their progress with the same lazy interest as before. Maybe it was the poor light or pain that was confusing her, but suddenly Katrine felt sure they weren't the seal they weren't the heads of seals at all, but of humans, the mother and son who had vanished beneath the ice sixty years before. End quote. These seals are reminiscent of a much more malevolent seal in 